Here's how to actively subvert your enemies. Use this if you want to get your competitors to not take any action or you want to be able to perform something in a kind of a quiet, isolated environment. Justin Hit from Inside Strategic Relations. The first thing you do is teach them useless things. So in the marketing world, if your competitors are wondering how you're so successful with your marketing campaigns and you describe to them this elaborate scheme of doing banner ads or pay-per-click marketing, but you're really doing direct mail, you have subverted their actions because they're going to copy your successes. But of course, you've described things that didn't work out. Arnold Schwarzenegger talks about this when he was doing body bodybuilding. Uh, folks would ask him how he got so big and how he got so strong, and he told them to eat peanut butter. And he told them just basically eat as much peanut butter as you can. It's got protein, it's got oils, it's got everything you need to make big muscles. And people would say, you know, one group would say, oh no, it's got too many fats. That's not going to be good for you. Another group would say, well, look at Arnold. Look how strong he is. We should follow his advice. And basically, by the time the competition came came along, the people who ate just peanut butter were very lethargic. They didn't have the muscle definition that they desired, and they just were not good competitors. Meanwhile, Arnold, who ate the, the meal that was necessary to get the body strength and, and uh, form, uh, was able to win the competition. And it's a very simple uh, method. It's not necessarily lying. You might be doing, uh, in the case of marketing, you might be doing some social media, but it might not be the most effective thing that you're doing. So it's just a means of of subverting the activity of your competitors. Another option, and there's there's like 50 of these options, I'm only going to cover two of them, uh, is to uh, get your competition to complain but not take action make it easy to complain now you're going to see this in social media today it is so easy to bitch and complain about stuff and whine about why won't somebody do something about this why won't somebody do something about that well successful people have an internal locus of control they don't ask why wouldn't someone else do it they do a careful weighting of of uh, benefit and uh, loss, and they th then they do something. They say, what can I do about this situation? They can't do anything. They don't worry about it, and they stop complaining. But if you can get people to complain about the things that bother them, you can then discover what it is that they, they're bothered by and offer them a solution. You can be that savior that comes in and helps them get to the next level and, and helps them address their concerns and frustrations. But if you can get enough people to complain, then you've got news media. News media simply is the echoing of these complaints but while layering on what seems like facts. Now, a new book I'm reading is Informed Consent, and it is a very shocking book. But the gist of it is, is that media is designed to sell advertising. And if you can get somebody involved in a conversation of complaining or a conversation of, of just wishing and hoping... Uh, you can keep them engaged long enough to sell them advertising or to, or to present to them solutions in the form of advertising. But the same works in your trade associations. The same works in your business. In fact, you should be looking through your organization and whoever's complaining the most, they're the least likely to be getting anything done. So you want to talk in the form of solutions rather than the form of complaints, rather than discuss what you'd like to have changed because change is the worst thing possible you can have in an organization that needs to produce consistent results. And you can say, look, let's not talk about the change. Let's talk about the outcome we'll create. How do we create that outcome? Now, with your competitor, of course, how would you like to change? You know, what are the things that bother you the most? What's the biggest challenges you face? You can use those as stepping off points to find a solution. But you can keep someone talking about those complaints and frustrations and they'll get weaker and weaker and weaker. They won't be able to address the complaints and they'll find it very satisfying to bitch and complain. In fact, some people, that's what they do, hence social media. Now, I'm trying so hard to stay off of social media. I do use it as a research tool and I do research individuals and the, uh, the, the challenges that they face. There's so much information there. But when you use these two, two strategies, you have to be very careful that you use them to eventually, uh, in the shorter term possible, uh, eventually you're going to help the person who is complaining. So if a competitor is complaining about not getting a lot of business and they're asking you, how do you get so much business? Um, you're not going to deliberately cause them to fail, but you may set up a relationship 
where your success becomes their success. So in fact, they profit through you. So for example, that could be a subordinate relationship where they become a subcontractor. They might come to you and say, well, how do you get so many jobs? How do you get so many of these contracts? You might say, look, I would love to share that with you. I would like to give you every intimate detail, but I think we could benefit the customer better if we work together to form an alliance and serve the customer in this way. So you've, de- you've deflected the question. You're not going to tell them the, the one thing that you do that, that they could easily do but doesn't work out well. Uh, but actually, if you told them the exact truth and all the details of what you do to get the results that you get, most people won't do it. But the, the, to be fair, though, you want to divert that energy into something that benefits them and benefits you mutually. Now, the reason we do this is because if you have a whole population of people who you can rile up to complain, uh, you end up with protests. If you have a whole population of people you can rile up to complain but never take any action, uh, they get abused and this the overall situation is reduced. Understanding the principles of strategic relations gives you a certain level of responsibility when it comes to the application. If you take the willingness to complain and you apply it to a figure, such as uh, the complaints about Donald Trump, uh, you end up with Trump derangement syndrome. If you flip that over and you have the, the complaints focused on Nancy Pelosi, for example, then you have this, uh, oh, she can't do anything right or, or you know, crazy Nancy or, or uh, you know, crazy Biden. And you miss out the underlying factors that both parties make logical mistakes that are not good for the country. Uh, Like, for example, giving out $2 trillion worth of money because the government shut down the government. The government shut down the country. They didn't shut down the government. Of course, they all are on vacation right now. Uh, But long story short, again, giving a channel to complain weakens the other party. You will always be weakened if you complain. If you constantly complain about what's going on and you wish and hope somebody else will take take a, you know charge of the situation and and make this and fix this problem, you will always be subordinate to the person who eventually steps up and solves the problem. So let's look at it from a growth perspective. If you are the person who analyzes the complaints, don't get involved with them, you don't have to be a part of the complaint, but analyzes the complaints, look for common threads and factors, and then takes a proactive approach to apply solutions that create outcomes that people can latch onto, you're more likely to get a following, you're more likely to gain the influence you need to be a decision maker rather than to be a pawn. Uh, you'll, you'll gain this sphere of influence that in sh- it increases in value. Now, of course, this mob can turn against you. You have to get them as quickly as possible from complaining mob to productive uh, focus. That's organization. That's um, using communications and writing rather than speaking. Uh, using communications that have been well thought out rather than impromptu communications. And, and you're going to leverage this. Now, you're subordinating the group. Don't get me wrong here. You're subordinating the competitor to put them a part of a trade association or alliance that establishes rules so that they can only do the rules within the association. Uh, and, and meanwhile, you're not that type of company, so you can do whatever the hell you want. Uh, you're subordinating uh, supporters around a decision. Uh, you get to the point where you've gathered their insights and you've gathered their information, present it back to them in a, in a hearable way. They all agree to it. They let you be in charge and then you move forward. Uh, but ultimately, you do your best to not take advantage of the situation because a handful of complainers, all it takes is one person to come out and start complaining in the right way or loud enough, and it's a huge inconvenience. Not only is it a huge inconvenience, it could put you in legal pr- in trouble. It could put you in a bad light that would prevent you from getting a contract or a job or an opportunity. And it is a just a god-awful time waster. It is a time waster to complain. Now, Like I said, I'm trying to get away from social media because I see the complaints there. And I try when I do post to provide something of value to elevate the conversation. I also am using social media to create draft materials for other sources. So I'm not I'm not paying tribute to the complaint in my response. I'm simply uh, looking at it and saying, well, how is there a solution here? Have there been solutions to this in the past? And what can I cultivate to provide to my my list, to my clients, to my people, so that they can have strategic outcomes? So I've shared with you two strategies here. 
uh, it's, and I, I've been very careful with my words because they, these strategies of getting people to complain but not take action is, is a – once you know this exists, you'll see politicians doing it. You'll see your friends doing it. You'll see people sitting around and, oh, the weather today is horrible and, you know, uh, you just can't do the things that you used to be able to do and my bones hurt. You know, there's always something you can do. There's, in fact, there's probably more things you can do than sitting around and complain all the time. But sitting around and complaining feels like something. And I'll leave you with this. It also has a biological response where you can actually feel more comfortable complaining than you would the challenge that comes with trying something different. If you're sitting on the front porch and it's pouring down rain and you really wish you could go out and do something outside, you've got to immediately switch your mind and say, look, that's an option for another day and then go inside and do something else or just sit on the porch and enjoy the rain and maybe read a book or something and be thankful that you've got a porch and that you're not out there in the rain doing things. It's a mindset shift. It's an understanding of the concept concept so that you know when it's being used on you, uh, like opinion surveys, for example, getting you worked up about an idea. A politician might be getting you worked up about an idea, but not really yeah, taking you to a call to action. Uh, and then sometimes they take you to a call to action that is something that feels like you're doing something like donation, like giving a donation or supporting a cause, but you're not actually doing anything. So contributing money to the cause doesn't improve the situation other than giving funds to the people who asked for it, who aren't likely going to spend 100% on the solution anyway. So I'm Justin Hit with Inside Strategic Relations. That's just kind of an example of some of the detailed things that we get into behind the closed doors in the strategic uh, mastermind that we call Inside Strategic Relations. If you have any questions about this or anything else that I share, uh, please visit us at www.insidestrategicrelations.com. I'll answer your questions in a podcast or, or in a direct response to you. Uh, but I want to encourage you to use these things to improve society, to improve outcomes for as many people as possible, and to start building stronger networks and relationships, starting with your inner circle, uh, building out, and being a real value to, the, uh, to society. Only through value creation where you gain sustainability, and only through value creation where you be able to take your skills to the next level. Thanks for listening. Again, I'm Justin Hitt with Inside Strategic Relations.